Okay, so Alistair, thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to the students. Your work on lean analytics is is very important to us as, as we're thinking about the uh, tech startups. The first question I've got for you uh, is that you've done a lot of work with technology entrepreneurs and uh, why is this an area that you find interesting? What attracts you to this type of work? Uh, I think it has to do with the, uh, innov the cycle time of innovation. Um, Paul Graham once said that uh, not every startup, not every uh, startup is a tech company, but many necessarily are. And that has to do with the fact that when you are dealing with technology, um, you can create a unique message for each target customer instead of building one product and bringing it to market for many customers. And the speed with which you can iterate, how quickly you can try out three ads or um, change part of the content or the behavior very quickly uh, is remarkable because ultimately uh, you can personalize things at scale um, and you can change things in production. And so technology, um, because it is a because tech is about giving opinions to the device or the product in the form of software, uh, tends to be much better at experimentation and therefore much more interesting uh, and faster to iterate than traditional brick and mortar businesses. Absolutely, it's a, it's a fast moving environment where you can do and try lots of new things. I guess. Well, and and you can actually deliver a different product to each customer. Uh, which is the nature of split testing, whereas you can't deliver economically um, uh, a unique product to each customer in physical goods and and when you have uh, you know intermediaries and third party channels and so on. Tech often circumvents the traditional uh, bulk breaking and assortment functions of a marketplace, um, which would normally happen <clears throat> in marketing. But but if you think about tech companies, you know Uber doesn't really have a middleman, so Uber can go and call a customer and say, "How was your ride?" Whereas in a taxi company, you got the taxi, you got the dispatcher, you got the taxi company owner, maybe the local regulator. So um, many of these things, the immediacy with which you can talk to an individual customer, um, the ability to customize and personalize the experience on a per customer basis, the ability to push changes into production. when I mean, you can't really push a change to the shelves at Walmart um, without disrupting things quite a lot. Absolutely. So your work is aligned with the lean startup approach of Steve Blank to, to a large degree. Uh, what do you see as the main benefits of that type of approach? So I think um, Steve Blank's original work and of course Eric Ries's uh, writing on top of it uh, are um, a recognition of what changes when things iterate this quickly. Um, again, it's all about experimentation and, and, and doing th the biggest lesson that people didn't take away from lean and I think is the most important lesson of all, is identify the riskiest assumption in your business and um, check it first. So if I, so I've had a few tech companies. If I said to people, I'm going to build the next Facebook, their incredulity is not Alistair can build that because I can probably give it enough money and enough uh, called in favors, corral a bunch of smart geeks and build the infrastructure. Their incredulity is no one will care. So the riskiest part of my business assumption is is not, can I build it? It's, will anyone care? So all of my initial iterations should be to test whether I can get people to care. Uh, there was an example of somebody who wanted to do a Twitter-based gifting service where um, you could, I could send you a gift on Twitter. And I would literally say, I'd like to send this person a gift and you'd get a message saying, please follow us and we'll give you someone, a gift is waiting for you. And uh, yeah, you know, I would enter my credit card and, and the whole thing would happen through Twitter. To experiment with that, they, um, the first service they did was sending out a postcard because the postcard was like the minimum thing you could do. They didn't have any question about whether they knew how to physically ship a gift to someone. That's a well understood process. They knew, the question was, would people be okay with this sort of strange DM handshake? And so the, the real core lesson of Lean Startup is find, identify the riskiest part of your business assumption and then test that. And the test that part is what's new in a tech era because there are new ways of testing it very quickly and getting an answer at scale for small amounts of money. But people forget that the hardest part of your business is sort of know thyself and understand what your really risky assumptions are. And they're almost always around, will anybody care? Not, can I build it? Absolutely. So part of your fo focus and the main subject to this interview is lean analytics. So uh, why are conventional accounting approaches insufficient for tech startups? I would say, I'm going to be meaner than insufficient. I would say dangerous and misleading. Uh, so the biggest reason is this. Steve Blank said that um, 
A startup is an organization created to search for a sustainable, repeatable business model. The corollary of that is that a large organization is, is created to perpetuate a sustainable, repeatable business model. Most traditional accounting is about verifying that the perpetuation is continuing as planned. It um, assumes that tomorrow is like yesterday, only more so. And as a result, most accounting approaches come up with things like year-long budgets and return on investment and things like that. Well, the return on investment may be a piece of learning. That's very, very hard to capture that. I mean, if you go to your CFA and say, boy, I learned a lot with all the money I wasted, you're going to get yelled at. And so I think um, innovation accounting is really sort of keeping track of the innovation that you've found along the way. But even more than that, um, there are uh, the, the things that you want to count in the early stage are like, how much did I learn? Uh, later on, there are things like, uh, how much did customers leave me? Uh, I'll give you a great example. There's a, an invest, a company I invested in that's doing a Series A. Very early on, they experienced extremely high churn, uh, which means that if you look at their cost of customer acquisition, it was really bad. And it's even worse if you average it over time. Their cost of customer acquisition in the last few weeks has gotten really good because they finally figured out what they should have been doing. Traditional accounting would say, what's your average cost of customer acquisition over the last year? And it would muddy all of the poisonous, horrible, bad first few months of discovering who they were with, uh, it would, that would pollute all of the last few weeks of, wow, it's awesome. We found what we're doing and things are just going through the roof. So even things like using averages instead of cohorts, um, like not having a good way to account for, um, uh, innovation or learning, uh, all of these things cause traditional investors. And this, this happens with real, with angels very often cause traditional investors to look at, you just show me a spreadsheet with your monthly, monthly averages, right? Um, or quarterly averages, quarterly, that's, that's an eternity. So time frames, the information you're capturing and, and often the need to report like, yeah, we understand why you need to report your balance sheet, income statement, all those other traditional accounting <laughs> outputs. They're not that relevant to an early stage company that still hasn't figured out what it's doing. Makes sense. So you've written about lean analytics and, uh, what would you say were the main aspects of it? The main elements that people need to think about Sure. So the, the first thing is that what, what happened was Ben and myself, along with two other um, uh, founders, Ian Ray and Raymond Luke, uh, started an accelerator called Year One Labs in Montreal. And we were a little frustrated by the idea that accelerators last three months and all they do is teach you how to pitch. So we said, let's do one that uh, lasts a, up to a year and you get your innovation in tranches, your funding in tranches to innovate on finding your product idea, uh, testing your product idea, and then getting funding. And Halfway through, the companies that were in the accelerator were doing pretty well, but they would say things to us like, oh, we're doing great. Our churn is 17%. And we'd say, oh, that's nice. wonder what that means. We had no idea. And this is circa 2009, 2010. And so we went to find out what was good for churn, and it turns out nobody knew. And we thought, this is a bit weird, because if you're told to draw a line in the sand, you should probably know if that line in the sand is high on the beach or going to get washed away by the waves, right? And so we... Um, we started asking and, and at first people were careful uh, about giving us the information, but the more we asked, the more people acknowledged it. And it sort of started this wave of people on the web and on Twitter coming clean with their numbers. Uh, so for example, if I told, told a traditional salesperson, they lose a quarter of their customers a year, they get hives and start <laughs> getting really nervous, right? But a quarter of your customers a year is, is 2% churn a month, which is almost as good as the best companies in the industry can get. So if you don't know that, you're, and we talked to companies like this, there were companies that were just killing themselves, trying to get 2% a month down lower when they should have been working on, um, for example, uh, cost of customer acquisition. So lean analytics is really about knowing what metric matters for your business at the stage of growth you're at, and then figuring out what that metric should be, the sort of line in the sand, and then iterating experimentally until it gets there before proceeding to the next stage of growth for a company. So you don't scale prematurely, for example, or you don't um, try and worry about a product being viral until you know that it's sticky for users. Okay. And so how does lean analytics fit in with the lean startup model overall? You've got somebody who's pursuing the lean startup model for their business. How does lean analytics become part of that? Well, I mean, they're, <clears throat> they really are dovetailed. Uh, we joke that if Eric Rees wrote a book saying art is beautiful, uh, we wrote a book saying color by numbers when you see the number two paint blue. 
Um, so Eric wrote the foreword for our book and is the series editor for the Lean series. So it's very complimentary. And we've actually taught uh, Lean Analytics at the Lean Startup Conference every year since it started as a workshop. Um, the, it fits in very well. I think one of the things that, that is a very clean fit is Eric talks about the three engines of growth for a company. So um, Eric is a proponent, of, and I agree with him, that uh, the only sustainable growth a company will experience is that of... Um, that, uh, that of activity from its customers. So you can only grow if your customers do something. In other words, you could grow by getting out every morning and hustling, but that's a lot of work and it's not sustainable. But if your customers do something and that leads to growth, it is. And Eric says there are three forms of sustainable growth. He calls them the three engines of growth. Uh, one is stickiness, which is your customers stick around. Their action is to keep coming back. And then you only have to add a few customers and it keeps generating revenue. The second is virality. Your customers tell their friends and bring their friends in. And as a result, your customers become your salespeople. And the third is price or revenue, which says you charge enough money to make a little bit extra money, which you can then use to um, do paid acquisition of customers at a lower price than the money you extract for them. So you bring in customers and you uh, do so at a more cost efficient way. We like those three things, the virality, the stickiness, and the revenue. So in Lean Analytics, we propose that companies should go through five stages. Um, the first stage is that of empathy, which means sort of know your customer fine. Uh, specifically, it's find a real unmet need that a reachable market is aware of. And we put it that way because you could spend a lot of time educating the people on their need, or you could um, satisfy a need that's already somewhat well met, and that would suck. So find a real unmet need that a reachable market faces and is aware of. But after that, you want to get into Eric's stickiness engine because you want to say when customers do something, um, they keep coming back. Otherwise, why bother with advertising and revenue if they're just going to show up and leave? Once they're sticky, then we say um, focus on virality because the more customers tell their friends, the more customer you'll bring in each time you acquire a customer. You'll be acquiring like 1.3 customers. Uh, then we say focus on the, the price and revenue stuff, which is all about customer acquisition cost versus the customer's lifetime value. And finally, we say focus on scale, which is like, okay, you're beyond this and now you're ready to, um, ex to dramatically increase your rate of growth uh, because you found the right product for the right market. Now it's all about can you increase your revenues disproportionately to your costs. Okay. And as how also considering the idea of the relationship between lean analytics and the lean startup, how are analytics related to business model canvas or lean canvas uh, that organizations might be using? Sure. So um, if you look at Osterwalder's work or Moria's work, they have a very good way of charting out the sort of um, the factors that, that describe a business. Uh, each of those factors probably has a metric or a KPI associated with it. So if you, if one of your things says, I will acquire my customers via Google AdWords, then you have a cost associated with that and that becomes a metric you should track. So almost every metric in there, every line in there is, is essentially a potential metric. Now there is a caveat there. Um, if you have many metrics, you will suffer um, a lot of confusion. One of the scarcest resources in a startup is focus. And so you really need to know which metric to focus on first. And the nice thing about that is that once you've optimized one metric, the next metric often reveals itself. If your metric is traffic to my website, the next metric might be um, number of people who consider the offer. And from that, it might be number of people that put it in a shopping cart and the number of people that uh, convert and number of people that um, give me a high rating afterwards. So the next metric sort of reveals itself. But the danger of the business model canvas is unless you look at it and, and take a really hard look at it and say, what is the riskiest of these squares? Which of these tiles in the sort of business quilt I've built is most on fire. Um, you don't tend to take a very good analytical perspective. And the, one of the reasons is just like solving an equation in math, you have to move the independent variable to the left and solve for it. If you have several variables on both sides, it's really hard to solve the equation. Okay, thank you, that, that makes sense. And so you're talking there about the different uh, analytical stages and you're also talking about the need for focus and and presumably one metric that matters that's uh, discussed inside your book. Yeah, we spent we got a lot of grief because we said one metric that matters. And people thought we'd come up with the magical metric. Of course, the magical metric is profitability, so that's easy. Um, but the reality is that there is only there should be only one metric that matters to your business at a given time. And which business model you're in and which stage you're at is what matters. So, for example, if I 
say, um, I'm a SaaS company, then metrics like churn and retention are going to matter a lot. If I'm an e-commerce company, yeah, I'm going to be much more focused on shopping cart size. Um, and so depending on the kind of business, the metrics gonna change, but that will also change over time. Um, it'll change earlier stages. You care more about are people coming back later stages. You care more about, did I acquire them cost effectively? And so, um, yeah, the, the, the idea of one metric that matters, um, is, is more a, a clarion call for focus. The most highlighted line in our book, um, is if it won't change your behavior, it's a bad metric. So when Brad Feld became a board member at uh, Moz, which used to be SEO Moz, he said, look guys, um, you have too many metrics here. I want you to focus on one. And they came up with the metric of net ads. And net ads is the number of customers you added minus the number of customers you took away. If net ads is positive, you're growing. If net ads is negative, it's bad. That's all you need to run a company at a board level um, when you found your product market fit. Because if net ads suddenly goes down, you can dig in and say, what did we do? And now you care about sort of analytical metrics at the next level, which may be something that a manager has. You know, once the organization gets big enough, you have a management hierarchy where the board may be interested in net ads, but someone else may be interested in sort of campaign effectiveness because that's their job. Okay. Uh, now, another interesting concept in your book, I think, is the idea of normal inside lean analytics. So what do you mean by this? Well, what's, what's normal in lean analytics? So the, the funny thing about normal is that sometimes you can tell, um, sometimes you have to go compare with others. Google used to have a thing where they would show you baselines for different metrics. And, um, it, it, it doesn't work as well because Google found it was kind of misleading because people were reading into it without understanding the context of like, this is a blog or, you know, this is a shopping cart store. And, um, the, the idea of normal is really, um, the baseline against which you believe a metric should be qualified. And once the metric gets to normal, you can turn it into a reporting metric, meaning you don't need to tell me over and over again what the value is. Just let me know if it goes outside the threshold. If I know churn should be below 5%, once I get it below 5%, don't keep bugging me with churn until something goes horribly wrong or horribly right. Um, manage it by exception. I have other metrics to look at. And so um, the normal is often generated by comparison stuff or by what your business model says it should be. You can also do some... Um, some math to decide what normal should look like because as your, um, if you imagine a curve of diminishing returns, when you start to improve conversion rate, you may get huge gains. And then over time, your gains become smaller and smaller and smaller for additional effort. You could plot that as a, an exponential curve that has a limit. So it's sort of curving off to a flat line. Well, when you project that flat line, that shows you where normal is for your current business model. And without a change, a significant change to your business model, that's as good as you're going to get that metric. If you then take where the, the limit of that curve is and you look at it on your uh, business model, you should be able to say, well, I think that's going to taper off at 8%. Is 8% good enough for my business? If it isn't, I probably have to make some changes elsewhere. I have to modify something else. So you can actually use that to sort of do projections on um, what normal should look like. Okay, that, that's clear. So uh, for people who do implement lean analytics, uh, what do you see as the main issues or problems that they might have and, uh, and what should they do to avoid those? So the first problem is discipline because this stuff's boring and you got into startups because you wanted to build stuff. So that's the first, first problem of all is like, this is hard. Um, the second problem I would say is it doesn't always work. It's harder to do in business to business environments because you can't easily experiment on, let's say you have 10 high value customers and you want to deliver a B2B product. It's very hard to experiment in front of them. And we talk a little bit about some of the ways to do that, but you do have to change your, um, your metrics. For example, um, instead, of ask, instead of asking yourself virality, you may care about things like net promoter score or willingness to write a case study or be used as a reference customer. Those are proxies for, um, for virality because it's unlikely that someone's going to tweet, hey, I just bought an ERP. Um, and so there's, there's other things like that uh, that we've identified as ways of sort of targeting the B2B customers. Uh, the other is if you're doing a project that has a great deal of creative um, or if you're doing a project that has strong network effects, you may need to get, you may need to change the order of things. So for example, Skype, it would have been very hard for Skype to seem valuable when there were only two users. Um, it's very usable and very useful when there's a network effect that has a large number of users. So how do you test that, right? Um, and so there are certain classes of products that it's okay to defer um, the, some of the steps until later, but they're usually not the case. Like I, I almost hesitate saying that publicly because 
I think a lot of students would be like, well, mine isn't that special category, so I don't need to prove that my product works or I don't need to prove revenue. Yes, you do. You just have to find proxies for it. Um, you have to find a way of testing like the guys with the postcards did to say, I'm going to test the, the risky assumption, right? Um, the risky assumption may be how do you acquire customers or it may be uh, do people actually like using the application? And this all comes down to what Eric talks about in the Lean, in the Lean Startup, uh, the idea of the MVP or the minimum viable product. It's the least you can do to test or repudiate an assumption. Okay, so it also strikes me that Lean Analytics potentially has relevance outside of the startup world. So with large established organizations, are you, are you seeing interest from them? And, and is there... Uh, do you think there is a relevance there for the approach that you're arguing for? Yeah, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last two or three years is my phone keeps keeps ringing with people from, from large companies. Um, so I think if you look at, uh, I mean, normally I'm not quite as scruffy as this. I'm usually wearing a shirt with buttons. Um, but I'm spending a lot of time talking to companies in Europe, in uh, South America, in Africa, in Asia, big, big companies with big Bs behind their, their financial statements. Um, and all of them are looking to do this either to help them innovate uh, or to apply it to uh, new products or uh, new innovation divisions. And so much so that I started writing a bunch of stuff um, on a blog called Tilt the Windmill. Um, it's, an old, it's a head nod to uh, the idea that if you're an entrepreneur, you're probably tilting at windmills if you're in a big company. Uh, but also that, that uh, a pinball machine, when you play it too hard and do something you're not supposed to, tilts. And this idea of uh, tilting stuff is quite interesting. So... Um, I think the, um, the large companies will do this, but they tend to do it for product innovation or for feature testing, some of those methodologies. Um, and, and sometimes those companies will do it for market launches and, and sort of campaign introductions, but certainly adopting those methods of, of figuring out the minimum feature to test it um, and, and much more focused on uh, go-to-market strategy and, and features rather than building the whole company from scratch. I'll give you a great example. Um, Mercedes-Benz has... Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is the three maxima of innovation. Uh, there's a very clever British um, technologist polymath named Simon Wardley who talks about the three sort of postures of innovation, and he describes them as pioneers, settlers, and town planners. So a pioneer is frustrated by the status quo and heads west. The settler says, this looks nice, let's camp out here. And the town planner says, we should build a water main, uh, which of course irritates the pioneer. Um, and so if you think about those three postures um, for innovation, uh, and this is boring on some of the work of Clay Christensen and others, um, you have sustaining innovation, which means do more of the same, only better. You have adjacent innovation, which means change something about the product, the market, or the method you're going to market with. And then you have uh, disruptive innovation. And everyone loves the word disruptive, but it literally means will break something. So disruptive better change the status quo. So an example of that for Mercedes-Benz is sustaining innovation is next year's um, Mercedes-Benz. It may have another cup holder, maybe a nicer color, but it's pretty much the same car, i.e. same product, sold in the same way, uh, dealer channel, um, to the same market, people who want a car to drive. Um, if Mercedes introduces an electric car, now you have a new product sold in the same way to the same channel. If Mercedes introduces a car service, which they do, by the way, because Mercedes owns Car2Go, that's disruptive, because if Car2Go is successful, then the other two actually lose market share. It cannibalizes the other two. And so I love this example because it's very hard to find companies that are innovating on all three maxima at once, that are doing sustaining uh, adjacent and uh, disruptive innovation concurrently. And Mercedes is doing this quite well. And you need to compartmentalize those two. Like, like nobody in, in the first sustaining thing likes car to go because it's reducing car sales. So it's their enemy. So the organizational immune system wants that not to happen. And what you see is that smart business strategists recognize that if they don't cannibalize their business, someone else will. They don't want to be blockbuster to someone else's Netflix. So they actively create these three maxima and give them space and financing and in the organization to survive. Okay, thank you. I just have one last question, which is uh, your uh, advice for aspiring technology entrepreneurs if you've got, you know, one piece or two pieces of advice that you would give them, uh, what would it be? Uh, the, the shortest piece of advice I can give them is if you don't have a business model, it's a hobby. So, like, it's great to build stuff, but if you want to build it and you don't know you're actually going to be able to build a business model, 
you're either asking a VC to act as a patron to fund you or you're just building a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with hobbies. By all means, go do it, right? But, but you need to have a business model if, you are on, if you're being an entrepreneur. And that business model is a set of assumptions you should test. And the sooner you test them, the more likely you are to find out um, what you should be doing. But the best advice I will give you of all uh, is something we included our, in our book from a guy named Bud Cadell. Uh, he's a very funny writer. And it's a Venn diagram. And it has three interlocking circles. I'm going to describe art now, which is awful, but I'll try. It has three interlocking circles. Uh, one of those circles, it says um, uh, what I can do or what I'm able to do. One says what I can be paid to do. And one says what I want to do. And, he, and I think this should be on the wall of every career counselor anywhere. And it should be what you decide when you're starting a startup. Um, things that you can do and want to do, but can't be paid to do, he says you should learn to monetize. Things you can be paid to do and want to do, but can't do, you should go and learn those skills. Things you can be paid to do and can do, but don't want to do, you should learn to say no. And in the middle is where you should spend your life. And I think that part, people forget that part about learning to say no. It is as important to pick a thing you want to build. It's not enough to go, I can sell widgets to these people. I hate selling widgets, but I can sell them. You know, I think that just sucks your soul. If you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you're probably at the start of your life, particularly if you're a university student, you're going to spend years working on things. Many of them will crash and fail. There's a significant chance that what you do will die. Um, and if you do succeed, that you'll just be acquired by some bigger tech company. You better make sure that the thing you're working on when you wake up is something you care about. So uh, the guy's name is Bud Cadell, B-U-D-C-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. And it's if you just Google Bud Cadell Venn diagram, you'll see it. But I think this is like, I, I almost think people should tape that to their wall and, and ask themselves every morning, am I still in that sweet spot in the middle or if I slid somewhere? Do I need to learn how to monetize this? Do I need to learn how to do this? Or should I say no to it? Uh, and that's probably the best advice that nobody gave me as an entrepreneur. Brilliant. And uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, do this today, Alistair. I, I really appreciate it. And I think it's going to be very useful for the students. Sure. Well, I hope they uh, learn a lot from your class. Appreciate you reaching out.